Well, hello everyone, and uh, to all of you at Revolution Church, Zach, Ilana, and uh, all of you wonderful people. Uh, my name is Brent, and it is such a huge privilege for me to be able to share uh, this next 30 minutes with you. I'm going to share a teaching with you, which I pray is going to be helpful. I have the privilege not just of uh, leading a local church, Outlook Church in Richards Bay, but also being part of the New Covenant Ministries translocal team and, and being able to teach and work apostolically in different nations and different areas. I can't wait to see you tomorrow and spend time with you face to face. But this is uh, just to get uh, to get us started. And so I'm going to do a teaching and uh, then off the back of it, going to give you some discussion questions. And I really hope and pray that uh, it would lay the foundation for something helpful that my gifting would come across and hopefully be able to add some value to you. So I want to pray and then we're going to get straight into it. Father, I want to thank you so much for this opportunity to be able to share your word. And I pray, Lord God, for the help of your Holy Spirit right now. Uh, Holy Spirit, you are the great teacher. You can take simple truths and you can breathe life into them and turn them into revelation inside of us. And Father, we long to see your kingdom extended. Father, we want your will to be done. Lord Jesus, we recognize you as our King, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus, let your kingdom come. Would you come and speak through me? Would you help us to take your word in? I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I love working apostolically. This year of being under lockdown has been, uh, it's been a, 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 an interesting year. I have to confess I've missed the traveling. I'm that guy. I love traveling. I love airplanes. I love staying with people. I love staying in hotels. In fact, I had the privilege of staying in a variety of hotels, you know, from uh, uh, little hotels by the airport to more luxurious ones. But I remember staying in one in particular in Malawi once. This goes way back. And I was doing a, a mission trip with a bunch of mates. We had our tent and we were, we were in southern Malawi and it was incredibly hot. And so we would pitch our tent and we'd stay here, there fighting off the mosquitoes. And eventually we get to one village and there's a prominent man in the church. He comes and he says to us, tonight you will not be sleeping sleeping in tents. Tonight, you are staying in my hotel. Now, I'm just like, whoa, Lord, thank you, Jesus. You've heard our prayer. Anyway, we get to this hotel, and this is when things started going a little bit pear-shaped. There was the name outside. It said whatever it was, hotel, but I noticed straight away there were no stars, but maybe in Malawi, you don't do the, the whole kind of star rating type thing. Yo, we were taken to our rooms, and uh, I mean, it was, it was probably like a prison cell, basically. But the difference was no bars in the window. In fact, it didn't even have glass, no windows. It was just, well, there was a hole. Now that presented a problem. You see, the problem is Malawi at that time, even at night, felt about 40 degrees. And so it was incredibly hot. Now in the room, there was, there was a, like a cot bed, and then there was this, this foam, thick foam mattress, and then one thick blanket. That's it. And I remember lying there at night thinking, you know, dear God, I know that I'm going to die. It's just a question now of deciding. If, if I just lie here and, and don't have the blanket on me because it's so hot, then, I mean, with this open window, the mosquitoes, they're coming in like wave after wave of mosquitoes. And remember, it's malaria area. And I mean, there's no chance you're not going to get malaria. So, so either I'm going to die from, from malaria or I could put the blanket over me and that's going to protect me from the mozzies. But already it's 40 without the, the blanket. So if I put the blanket on, that's going to ramp my... I mean, there's no way I'm going to survive. It's death by, 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 by overheating or death by malaria. That's how bad it was. Now, what's the point? The point is, it said hotel on the outside, but with no stars. I mean, I've been to another hotel once down in... I think it was in Cape Town somewhere on the beach. And I mean, up front, you know, when you see that word hotel and it's got five stars, you know you are in for the time of your life. My point is this. Many churches will say church, but just because it says church on the outside, you don't know what it's like on the inside. I want to talk for the, for the next while. I've called it five-star church. And really because I believe that a five-star church is actually a base church. And I believe Revolution Church, that God has called you to be a base church. Now, maybe you've heard about this concept before. Maybe you haven't. I would love to just lay something of a foundation because I truly believe that God is looking to establish base churches. And I believe the reason is if we are going to know Jesus more and make him known. The way we're going to make Jesus known effectively to the nations is by establishing base churches in every town, every city, of every country, of every continent right around the world. I believe that base churches are the key to discipling nations. In fact, 
Uh, I'm a privilege to be a member of the NCMI Apostolic Team and, and working in partnership with that team. The point of that partnership, if we're going to make Jesus known, is by using those Ephesians 4 gifts to help establish these base churches. So my desire over this weekend is to try and input into your lives and add value to you as a church to help with the construction of a radical base church. Now, you might be asking, base church, what's a base church? Well, Tyron Daniel, who leads the New Covenant Ministries team, he simply says it like this, a base church exists for the benefit of others. I love that. And it's fundamental and it's so important. At the heart of a base church is it's not about us. It's about others. I like to define it like this. A base church is a local church that exists to help disciple the nations. Fundamentally, in the heart of the church, it's not about us. God wants to bless us so that we can be a blessing to the nations. And I'll ex describe that a little bit more. But when I think about base, when you think or hear the word base, what comes to mind? Well, sometimes I would think about a military base. A military base is an established, uh, built-up area, but the purpose of the base, now the base could be in your own country or it could be in a foreign country, but a base is a strong, built-up military presence where soldiers are sent to be trained, they are equipped, they made ready, there's a hospital there to get them strong, and then from the base, they can launch out to take new territory to defend or to be sent wherever they are. A base is not a holiday club. You don't go there as a permanent destination. You go there to be trained, equipped, envisioned, so that you can be sent out for your country. What about climbing Mount Everest? You're not going to climb Mount Everest in a day, and you're not going to climb Mount Everest in one continuous journey. They've worked out the best way to conquer Mount Everest is base camp by base camp. So they would establish base camp one near the foot of the mountain where they'd bring all their supplies and they'd get their tents. And then they would go higher up the mountain and they'd establish base camp two where they would take more supplies. They'd go up and down, up and down, establishing base camp two. Then they'd go higher, base camp three. The purpose is not the base camp. The purpose is to get to the top of the mountain. But to get to the top of the mountain, they need those base camps along the way. The purpose is not to build base churches. The purpose is to disciple the nations so that Jesus can return. But if we're going to disciple nations for the return of Jesus, we need base churches, established, strong, healthy, outward focused, so that they can be a blessing to the nations, multiply and increase the effectiveness of what we do. So... Why do we need base churches? Well, you remember the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you and be sure of this. I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Do you notice there that it actually says make disciples of all nations. Now, it's difficult enough to make the disciple of one person, but Jesus has given us this huge commission to actually disciple nations. And remember, I believe the key to discipling nations, establishing base churches, every town, every city, and every country, in every continent. So NCMR, our vision to know Christ and to make Him known, that's our vision. But the mission as a team is by using those Ephesians 4 gifts. We need apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to use their giftings to help raise local churches to become effective based churches so they can multiply and expand. So I'm going to share with you five stars then. And I've tried to simplify it. And I've used this as our church is 20 years old now. And I've used this as a roadmap. I've used this as a blueprint to help with the elders try and lead the church and establish the kind of church that can be a blessing to the nations. I'm going to give you the five and then I'm going to go through them a little bit more slowly. Star number one, laying an apostolic foundation. I'll describe that now. Number two, developing gospel power in the church. Number three, building on biblical values. Number four, establishing a biblical leadership structure. And then star number five, effectively partnering with a translocal team. So that's where we're going over the next couple of minutes. So pens out, get your pad, notepad ready. The notes are available if you want to use those as well. But let's dive in to star number one. What do we mean by apostolic vision? Now, I've got a great mom, love it a bit. She's really sweet, but not very apostolic. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> Whenever we had our 
kind of family get-togethers and, uh, you know, we had the family around the table, especially once we'd gone off to varsity and started our job. So getting the family together was a huge thing for my mom. So when the family was finally sitting around the dining room table, I'm telling you, every single time at some point, my mom, you know, flustering around, getting the food ready, would say at some point, is everybody happy? <laughs> kind of that was her vision, her dream. She just wants the, ha- the family to be happy. Now, It's fine if you're a mom, but the reality is that's not apostolic vision. Is everybody happy? Yet, in many churches, doesn't matter what the vision statement says on the wall, in many churches, the real vision is let's try and keep everybody happy. Do you see what I mean in terms of it becomes a very inward focused about me, about my comfort, keeping people happy? Now, The church was never designed to have inward vision and it was never designed to have small vision. Jesus is our vision. The Bible says, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. And he's given us the great commission to disciple the nations, to go into all of the world. So to have apostolic vision means, and this is so important for a base church, is to lay a foundation stone. It is not about us. It's about Jesus. We're not called to be small, we're called to be large. We're not called to be settlers, we're called to be pioneers. Now, in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1, the NIV version says this, Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. Do you notice that distinction? Jesus, it's all about Jesus, our apostle and high priest. Now, the problem in many churches, as I've visited churches and and you kind of get a sense of the culture of a church, is sometimes if you imagine a seesaw, it's a little bit lopsided towards Jesus, the high priest. You see, Jesus is our high priest, the Lamb of God. He came to take away the sins of the world. He died for us. He has freed me. He represents me before the Father. I'm in because of Jesus. I can access the Father's presence. And it's a beautiful thing, but you notice that's about me. Jesus, as my high priest, has saved me, rescued me, represents me. And yet the focus is all about what Jesus has done for me. Now, in an apostolic vision, we shift the balance to bring it back to an equilibrium. Yes, he's our high priest, but he's also our apostle. Jesus left the comfort of heaven. Jesus left his father's side. Jesus paid the price to come from heaven to a dying and broken world to bring salvation. Now, to be in a base church means that becomes our vision. It's not about just about us. We want to live to be apostolic. Jesus, you came and you were sent. And now Jesus said, as the father has sent me, I am sending you. So we've got to bring that balance to be outward focused and going and not just staying. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, also from the NRV. And for us, this is a foundational, I believe every base church needs this scripture, this promise to Abraham as part of their foundation. Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3, the Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. Don't you love this promise? And I will bless you. I will make your name great and you'll be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Isn't that beautiful? I remember Dudley Daniel preaching from this text over and over. All people will be blessed through you. All nations will be blessed through you. We are called to be a blessing to the nations. And just like Abraham responded to that apostolic call, leave your country, leave your, your, uh, uh, your safe place, leave uh, that comfort zone and go in response to the call of God. And as you go, I will bless. I want to tell you now, after 20 years of of leading a base church, this is true. It doesn't make sense in the natural economically or anyway, but but when we live to be a blessing, and that means sending our best, that means going, that means being a resource base, that means sending our finance. The more we live to be a blessing out there, the more God seems to pour out His blessing upon us. So come on, Revolution Church. You called revolution to change the status quo. Most churches are inward and uh, is everybody happy? God is calling you to be a base church. We've got to get out there as pioneers, trusting God that as we go, we grow. As we live to be a blessing, God will bless us. So number one, base churches are outward focused and exist for the benefit of others. Number two, this is huge. Second star of a base church is developing gospel power. Now, you've heard about my mom. Let me tell you about my dad. Absolutely love my dad. 
There is a problem, however. When it comes to technology, you know, you can have a smartphone, but a smartphone, and, and I think about my phone just like your phone, it's got so much potential, there's so many apps, there's so many things that the phone can do. But if you've got a smartphone and, well, a dumb hand, then all of that potential is wasted. All he wants to do on his phone, and, and I love you, Dad, but all he wants to do is like green button, red button. Yes, answer the call, reject the call. That's kind of all he does. So you can have all of this potential. In fact, I read once in a survey that most people only use about 25% of technology's potential. Now, I studied engineering and that grieves my heart because as an engineer, you've designed a piece of technology with so much power and potential and yet people are only using 25% of it. I wonder when it comes to the gospel, what percent of the power of the gospel are we truly tapping into? You see, Paul said it like this in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of this good news, the gospel about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes. In other words, the gospel is, is the power of God. And for me, certainly as, a, as an engineer, as a preacher, as a lover of Jesus, I want to see the power of that gospel radically transforming people, not entertaining the saints, not keeping people educated. No, no, transforming lives, broken lives healed, addicted lives set free, lives without hope, finding vision and passion, lives that are going nowhere now on mission. The gospel releases the power of God. Now as a base church, that's what we call to do. Not keep the people comfortable, but see the power of the gospel transforming broken, messy lives into trophies of God's amazing grace. I want to read as an example a couple of verses, quite long, but I want to read to you and give you a glimpse of a base church and the impact that the gospel made. Now, for most churches, the gospel is hopefully making some kind of impact in the church. But for a base church, the dream and the goal is to get the gospel making an impact, not just in the church, but into the city and region beyond that. I want to read from Acts chapter uh, 19 verses, I'll start from verses 8 to 12. And this is the story of when Paul was establishing the church in Ephesus. It says then Paul, verse number 8, then Paul went to the synagogue and preached boldly for the next three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some became stubborn, rejecting his message and publicly speaking against the way. So Paul left the synagogue and took the believers with him. Then he held daily discussions at the lecture hall of Tyrena. So from the, the religious area, the synagogue, now they've moved into the academic area, which is the university where they're having the church services. This went on for the next two years so that people throughout the province of Asia, not just the town or the city, the whole province, both Jews and Greeks, not just people like them, but people of different cultures as well, heard the word of the Lord. Verse 11, God gave Paul the power to perform unusual miracles when handkerchiefs or aprons that had merely touched his skin were placed on sick people. They were healed of their diseases and evil spirits were expelled. Now it's not just the church world, but the medical industry was changed. Why go to hospital when you can go and see Paul and the church at the lecture hall? Verse number 17 to 20, it says, The story of what happened quickly spread all through Ephesus to Jews and Greeks alike. A solemn fear descended on the city. Isn't that beautiful? Not just a solemn fear fell on the church, but on the whole city because of the gospel being preached by this church. And the name of the Lord Jesus was greatly honored. Many who became believers confessed their sinful practices. A number of them who'd been practicing sorcery brought their incantation books and burnt them at a public bonfire. The value of the books was several million dollars. I mean, hello. I mean, there's a whole witchcraft going on. So the whole spiritual climate, the strongholds, the demonic powers of the whole city were changed because of the gospel preached by this local church. So the message about the Lord spread widely and had a powerful effect. The story continues. Now the local businessmen, they made shrines to the local God, but because of the church and people were turning to Jesus, they weren't buying the little statues and shrines to the other gods. And so the whole business sector was changed. What's the point? The gospel should impact the city and not just the church. That's how base churches think. Academic se sector was influenced, not just the religious. The province and not just the town, the Gentiles and not just the Jews. The medical sector was impacted. The city came to fear God, not just the church. Demonic strongholds were brought down. The business sector was impacted. What's the point? Base churches impact cities and regions 
with the gospel. And I hope to share a little bit more with you when I see you tomorrow. The power of the gospel released to transform people who can transform cities for Jesus. So that was star number two. Let's quickly have a look at the third star. Building solidly on biblical values. I love telling the story. Some of you might have heard me share it before, but uh, the engineer inside of me loves the story. Anyway, it was about the owner of a, a huge block, an apartment block, multiple stories high. And a year after taking ownership of the building, it was a brand new building, he noticed on the 17th floor cracks appearing in the wall, which obviously concerned him. And so he called the engineer and said, uh, Mr. Engineer, you've got to come and have a look here because there's cracks on the 17th floor. So the day arrived, the engineer met the owner in the, uh, in the entranceway. As they walked to the bank of lifts, the owner was about to push number 17 to go up and see the cracks. And the engineer said, nope, I want to go down. Confused, they went, uh, the owner pushed the basement button, they went down to the bottom, and the engineer said, I just want to have a look around at the basement. And as he scanned the walls, he looked around what was happening in the basement of the building. He noticed there was an office in the corner, and, and he asked the owner, whose office is that? No, that's the caretaker, the janitor. And he found the janitor, they opened up the office, and what the engineer discovered was all along the wall in the janitor's office, bricks were missing. In fact, when he interrogated or when he questioned the poor janitor, he discovered to his amazement that the janitor was building an extension on his home because he'd had a new baby. And so what he would do, I mean, he has a, a building with millions of bricks. Who's going to notice a few bricks coming out of the foundation? And so every day he would carve out two or three bricks, put them in his briefcase, take them home so they can continue the extension of his new bedroom for his baby. And as he was taking bricks out of the basement, cracks began to appear in the 17th floor. What's the point? The point is, churches, lives, businesses can have cracks. There could be cracks in your church right now, relational cracks, habits where marriages are suffering, relations are suffering, addictions are happening. And here's the truth. All the cracks we see above ground are actually the result of foundational problems below the ground. It comes down to the gospel. I love this little saying, every problem is a gospel problem. Every solution is a gospel solution. We have to get back down to the root, the foundations, because that, if we fix the foundation, the cracks will take care of themselves. Now, let me give you some scriptures about that. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 and 25. Remember Jesus, after teaching about the kingdom, he said, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. That's what Jesus was saying. When we build according to the word of God, not just hear the word, but obey the word. When we put his word into practice, in our lives, in the church, in our families, in our business, when we build on the Word of God, we build strong so that cracks don't appear. Even though difficult times, corona comes, economic crisis comes, it will stand strong if it's built on the Word of God. Now in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul as the great apostle, his work as an apostle was helping churches find the cracks and deal with the foundations that were producing the cracks. And so he said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 3, 10 and 11, because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now, others are building on it, but whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful for no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. In other words, he saw the church literally like a physical building and has different gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. As ministry happens in the church, it's like you're adding layers and layers. But we have to build carefully on the foundation of Jesus with the Word of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, in love, trusting in Him. So what do I mean by Biblical values. I've got a list of 12 here, and, and you can have a look at the notes. I can't unfortunately teach through all of them, but I'm just going to mention a couple of them so that you get an idea of what it means. These biblical values should become the culture that the church is built on. These are not NCMR values. These are biblical values. Many of them, I didn't, certainly didn't come up with them. People like Dudley Daniel pioneered and, and opened up the Word of God, and, and, and we've been building, and certainly our church has been building on them for 20 years. Here's some examples. Number one, keep the main thing the main thing. In other words, it's all about Jesus. 
You say, oh, that's so obvious. Well, let me tell you, after visiting many churches, many churches, the focus is not Jesus. The focus might be someone's ministry. It might be money. It might be evangelism. It might be any other things. But here's the reality. Only the focus of Jesus is strong enough to keep the whole church together. Keep the main thing the main thing, which is one of the reasons I'm so passionate about being part of the New Covenant Ministries team, why I love Tyron Daniel. And, and as the leader of our team, he reminds us every team meeting, every equip, get back to Jesus. Focus on Jesus. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Number two, the Bible plus nothing, the Bible minus nothing. In other words, that value simply means we use the Word of God as the highest authority in the church. Not what I say, pastor says, the popes. No, what does the Bible say? Not add to it, not detract from it. Keep it to the Word of God. Number three, the whole grace of God. So it's not some hyper grace movement. No, no, remember, we come before the throne of grace. We hear about in Hebrews chapter four, verse 16. And before the throne of grace, we receive mercy and we find grace to help us in our time of need. In other words, true grace has the aspect of mercy, which forgives and washes and deals with our past. And it empowers us to overcome sin and be strong and be victorious. Now, the, the, the value here is that as a church we celebrate both mercy and empowering the forgiveness of the past the empowering for the future we need the whole grace of God organic and not organizational what does that mean it means God hasn't called us to be organizational yes we should be organized you should know when the church services happen and how you can get resources and all of those things but organizational means the policy and procedures become more important than what the Holy Spirit is doing we are an organic people the Holy Spirit the breath of God was breathed into Adam when we filled with the Holy Spirit the life of God fills us and Jesus is the head of the church he's the leader of the church to be an organic people means we're listening more to what the spirit is saying than looking maybe at the run sheet what do we have to do next what does the policy say we want to be an organic people flowing with the life of God Friendship before function means we value people and we build the church around genuine, loving, care for people. Not just for what they can do for the church, but for who they are. Build friendship, love one another, and not just function. Priesthood of all believers, that's right. Not just those up front are not just the priests. You don't have the, the clergy and then the laity. No, the Bible says we are priesthood of all believers. We're royal priests. That means every one of us have a part to play. Now, there's many more. Team at every level, servant leader. Leadership, building away from ourselves, not trying to make people dependent upon ourselves, going to the nations, supernaturally natural. In other words, living a supernatural life in a natural way, prophesying, praying for the sick without getting uh, weird into all kinds of weirdness and generous on all occasions. So what's the bottom line? Base churches are built to last because they're built on solid biblical values. Now, I'm going to land. So let me quickly give you the remaining Two, and maybe I can ask some questions and we can chat a little bit around them when I see you tomorrow. But point number four then, or star number four, is establishing a biblical leadership structure. This is huge. You know, I was reading uh, John Maxwell talking about the story of McDonald's. And the two McDonald's brothers were absolutely revolutionary. They invented fast food. They invented how do you serve a customer in 30 seconds, just like that. They, the, way you, the meal was made, the way the kitchen was laid out, the packaging, everything was, they radically revolutionized and they pretty much invented fast food. But they only managed to succeed in one restaurant, even though they tried to open five or six others. However, the milkshake salesman, he was the one who had a much greater leadership gift. He didn't invent the McDonald's concept, but he realized what they have discovered could go viral. And he took it from one or two restaurants until what it is today, this mighty McDonald's corporation. He had a leadership gift way bigger than the McDonald's brothers. So it stayed the name McDonald's, but he took it. It wasn't the McDonald's who actually made all the money. He made the money because he could see the potential and his leadership gift took it to a whole new level. Leadership is absolutely crucial. And in the kingdom, uh, oh, there's so much I could say. Kingdom leaders, there's a diligence. Yeah, some characteristics, diligent. Bible tells us that if your gift is leadership, then govern diligently. That means we should be growing. We should be investing in our leadership. We should take that responsibility seriously. 
Humble, oh, which is huge. Humility in the kingdom of God is the supernatural power because God takes the humble. He gives them grace and he promotes them. Mature. Uh, really, maturity is the ref- greater and greater reflection of Christ in our lives. Team-minded, courageous, visionary, others-focused. Oh, we could talk about this forever. Here's the point. Leadership, I believe a base church should be a seedbed for kingdom leadership. I, I like to remind people that the mighty men of David, it said uh, David's mighty men, they could shoot arrows or sling stones with their left hand and their right. Now me, I'm left-handed. This is the hand that I I naturally go to. But David's mighty men could use both hands. And I want to encourage you, church, it's good to grow your spiritual gift, whether it's prophecy, healing, preaching, whatever it is. But at the same time, grow your leadership gift. Come on, church, grow your leadership gift. Because remember the McDonald's? You could have an amazing gift, but without the leadership, that ability to inspire others, to build teams, to create vision, opportunity, without the leadership gift, your fruitfulness and effectiveness is limited. We need to be left and right-handed. And then lastly, let me finish with the fifth star, partnering with the big picture. What does that mean? It means building a great partnership together with a translocal or apostolic team as we have with the the New Covenant Ministries team. The church in Antioch was a beautiful example. Um, In Acts chapter 11, they received They sent, uh, the Jerusalem church sent Barnabas and Barnabas went in and the young church received apostolic ministry from Barnabas who helped establish the church. Then they sent Agabus and they received prophetic ministry to help shape the future of the church. They sent finances back to Jerusalem. How about that? Partnering together, they took a prophetic offering because they felt, ah, there's a, a famine coming. What about Acts 13? Now the church sends out teams to do apostolic ministry. Acts 14, the teams come back and encourage the church. It's the local church and apostolic team working together. Partnership is huge. In fact, in Philippians 1 verse 5, it says, For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. Partnerships is a huge thing. John Maxwell once said this, One is too small a number for greatness. Now, God has called us to great things. He's called us to disciple nations. No local church can do that alone. We need partnership. We need to do it together together according to the word of God. Base churches take the great commission to disciple the nations seriously. So how do we land this? Revolution Church, I believe that God has called you to be a base church. It's not about size. It's not about how many number. It's about heart, vision, capacity, willingness to, to, to grow, to build well, to become leaders, to see the power of the gospel released, to be outward focused, to partner well, so that together we can be a blessing to the nations. Now, here's what I'd like you to do as an exercise. Hopefully, uh, you've got the notes in front of you or Zach will have the notes. I'd love you to look at those five stars of a base church and maybe take a little bit of time and look at each one of them. Which one of these stars are you recognizing? Oh, this is a strength in our church. Maybe one of them is a bit of a weakness. I'd love you to look at each star in turn and ask yourself this question. What could this look like for us as Revolution Church? Maybe talk your way through those. And so when I see you tomorrow, hopefully we can have some more Q&A, discuss it and go a little bit deeper. May the Lord bless you. Thank you so much for listening so well. And I can't wait to see you tomorrow. God bless you and bye for now.